Hello, this is Chris Nelson from EvolveConsciousness.org. Today I'll be reading the article Universal Cosmic Natural Moral Law, which is known as Natural Law. This is uh, based on Mark Passio's podcast number 36. I've also added some additional information. These sections are natural law etymology, natural law alternate terms, natural law and man's law, consciousness as natural law expressions with the five sections from Mark Passer's natural law expressions chart. Then we have right and wrong, is force the same as violence, is killing the same as murder, and finally, the choice is ours. Natural law etymology. The word natural is present in or produced by nature. It's not acquired, it's inherent. Synonyms are innate, native, characteristic, indigenous, inherent. Well, it's from nature. Nature, natural. Something inherent. Innate. they are essential properties of a thing. Comes from the past participle of nasi, to be born. And if you look into... Some of the other work I did on etymology recently, I've tied in, and I think you can find them through axioms, existence and consciousness and identity, and the other one, tracing reality, a visionary quest to wisdom. In there I go into Nasi and Jan and Janer and relate care to knowledge. Anyways, to continue, nature is inherent and exists outside of a cause by humans. Nature is the universe, not simply green nature, the animals, or the environment of the planet. Also, the Egyptian word NTR, netar or necher, can be seen as the original source for the word nature, and netar has the meaning divine god or spirit. Natural, natural, then means related to spirit. It is the law whose essence comes from the spiritual domain and manifests in the physical reality. I haven't reviewed this, but I, uh, Netter, um, Matu Netter, I think it is, it means uh, the symbols of the gods, and that was referring to their language, and symbols contain the essence of meaning and definition. So, if you understand that, then Metu Neter, instead of just God, it'd be the symbols of God, symbols of spirit, symbols of the divine. I just want to add that. So it'd be the essence. What's natural is the essence of the divine God or spirit. If we want to get into the Egyptian aspect. I still need to review this. I'm just spurting this out as a, an inductive expression, I haven't verified it more and more in depth and cleared up all the, the symbolism, but just from what I'm recently reading I recall this aspect that relates where Metuneter is actually the symbols of the gods, and that was the hieroglyphs to display representations of reality through images, pictograms, symbols, hieroglyphs, art, and it expressed through symbols principles of natural law and reality, morality, our actions, our deeds, our thoughts, our care. And this was expressed visually. And that was the metuneter. All right, to continue with the article. Law. So it's principles, morality, conscience. Um, literally, it's something laid down or fixed. Law with a capital L is something laid down and put into a fixed position in existence. It's immutable and unchanging. So you have the minor laws of man's delusional laws to put down, and they're just based on arbitrary bullshit. And then there's real laws that are immutable and are objective and can be discerned by everyone, and they're not based on geographical location or the whims of a petty man. Next word is principle. This uh, means origin source, like an axiom. It's elemental, at the base, the beginning. 
origin cause, it's a first part, it's a foundation, it's prime. An accepted or professed rule of action or conduct, so principle can often be directly related to morality, which has to do with action or conduct, your behavior, what you have in your hands through your actions, because that's what represents us, that's what we possess at all times. If you want to learn more about that, you can look into the article on etymology, characters and our character, and I go into morality and behavior. No, it doesn't mean beehive. It means be have what you have. What you have in your hands. Your actions are always in your hands. You can have a pencil at one time or another, but your actions are forever and always in your hands. Continue. Principle of fundamental law, doctrine, axiom, such as the principles of physics. Some idioms are in principle, in essence, fundamentally. So when you're talking about something in principle, you're getting to the root of it, the essence. The on principle, you're talking about the, the, the ideal. It's on principle. You're doing something on principle. Not because it's a, it's a big deal, but because it's truth and it's what matters. So natural law or law of nature does not mean law of the jungle of our environmental condition. Natural law is not the imitation of the functionality of plants or animals in nature. Each species has its own nature to follow, not to imitate the nature and evolutionary development of other species. More on this truth later, which I have, since writing this article, I've expanded on more about the animal aspect of natural moral law. Neither is natural law the, quote, natural law from early 15th century or natural order as the apparent order in nature from the 1690s. Natural law is based in principles of truth about the reality we live in. Principles are first and foremost at the root, the most necessary and important, a foundation to build upon. The word principle expresses natural moral law in the very way we use the word itself, such as in principle and on principle. Natural law is an essential property of existence. It is born into being and is forever there in our reality without human causality. Our goal is to put these principles, these principle first things, first in our lives, as we would with capital, the real capital of truth and morality, which I have an article on. You can look for from capital to capitalism, a false proxy for enslavement or something. So our goal is to put these first principles, these principal first things first in our lives, to recognize and align with them because they are based in truth, not belief. Man's society is not putting original, generative, beginning, foundational principles first, but trivialities lies in deception. Therefore, natural law is not man's law. Here's a quote by Mikhail Bakunin. The liberty of man consists solely in this that he obeys the laws of nature because he himself recognizes them as such, and not because they have been imposed upon him externally by any foreign will whatsoever. Next section, natural law, alternate terms. Natural law, or universal law, cosmic law, spiritual law, moral law, is also known under other names. These terms use different words but essentially express the same concept once we understand what is being said. The law of cause and effect. Effect follows cause. For every action, there exists an equal and opposite reaction. In the Kabbalion, it says, Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. Next one is called the law of attraction. Many people misunderstand what this means. See, when you understand cause and effect, what you reap is what you sow, well then you can understand attraction is what you attract, is what you put out. So the energy you emit is the energy you attract. Energy flows where attention goes. So if you want to change the negative situation, well then look at the negative situation and then you'll be able to change it. 
It's not looking at the negative is going to make it more negative. Do you want to change the negative? Well, then look at it, and then you'll know what positive to do. So as long as you ignore the negative, then you're going to keep repeating the same negative because you are ignorant of it. All negatives and all evil must be known in order to not engage in them. Or you have to know what is right to not do those possible wrongs that you don't even know exist. But if you don't know about them, then you're going to keep creating them if you're already doing them. And if you don't know about them, then you're probably going to create them into the future as a possible solution because you don't know truth and morality enough. So here's a quote from James Allen. Not what he wishes and prays for does a man get, but what he justly earns. His wishes and prayers are only gratified and answered when they harmonize with his thoughts and actions. Nothing magical here. Nothing supernatural. Nothing special. It's all just you create, and that's what it is. And you get back based on the reciprocity of what everyone else is creating, based on what you're creating. And that's the world we live in. You reap what you sow. The energy you put out, that's what you're going to get back. If you don't do anything, well, guess what? You're not going to have anything. Karma, you reap what you sow. As you sow, so shall you reap. The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. Why is it golden? Look into etymology. Ah, it's not etymology. Symbolism. Golden. Yeah, what's the golden? What's golden around us? The most natural golden thing every day. Look up in the sky on a clear day. What are you going to see? The big golden disc in the sky. The, the light. Gold is, is reflecting light. That's why gold is symbolism for light and truth. Because truth is the light. And gold is the pure. And in alchemical aspects, you go from bronze to silver to gold. The perfected state, allegedly. But in terms of just the, the color and what it does gold, it reflects light compared to other colors which don't reflect light very well. But silver and gold do. Well, gold is very shiny, and it's the color yellow of the sun, which provides life to the earth, and it's the truth and the light. So the rule of truth and the rule of light and the rule of morality and the rule of justice and the rule of wisdom is the golden rule. You do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Morality is the most important thing in our lives. People don't get it yet. They don't want to go to the depths of morality. They think they're already living morally because they don't hurt other people around them. But they don't understand how what they do in their lives, what they buy, that's involved in immoral things. Our whole way of living is involved in immoral things. People aren't aware of it, so they can't possibly face themselves honestly and recognize how they need to change because they're not even aware of how corrupted they are. Also, we have the seven hermetic principles. These aren't, this isn't natural moral law, but these are other universal laws. These are seven base universal laws, known as the seven hermetic principles. Principle of mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. Go read the book, The Kaibalion, if you want more information. You can go study about it. Cause and effect is the one that's most representative of natural law. The other six are just part of the seven which are laws we can understand that are reflected in reality. So natural law is hermetically sealed. Nothing can touch it. It is always going to be in operation and will not change. Sealed forever. There are consequences to our actions. If we choose to align ourselves with dogma, false beliefs, lies, and deception, we will create suffering. If we choose to recognize truth and unite with it, by embodying principles of universal cosmic natural moral law, we will create freedom, peace, and order in our lives. Doing what is false, wrong, or bad creates more falsity, wrongness, and badness. Doing what is right, good, and true creates more of the same. We can choose to align with the forces of creation in reality as it is, the truth, 
or align with the fantasy illusions of man as God dictums of believing whatever we want. Natural Law and Man's Law Natural law is based on principles of truth, while man's law is based on beliefs and claims to authority. Embodying, harmonizing, complying, aligning, and living according to principles of natural law have been, has been done by people like Gandhi, who had recognized this knowledge, while most of us are living in the illusion of a myriad of law volumes that we are expected to understand. They fabricate nonsense into existence with rules and regulations to confuse and complicate our lives. We comply for fear of punishment if we do not. We can choose to become enlightened through an understanding of the forces of the universe as they are, or we can stay out of the prison cell of punishment by complying and basing our actions from the lowest modality of consciousness, fear. Man's law is based on the dictates of men giving power to create rules of conduct. These laws can be different from one time to another or one place to another. So how are they supposed to be based on right and wrong if they are always changing? Choosing what is right and wrong instead of recognizing right from wrong is moral relativism. Universal cosmic natural moral law is sourced from the cosmic forces of creation. Which force do you want to align yourself with? Do you want to choose right and wrong based on your own personal choices? You're going to dictate whatever you choose, that's right and wrong? Or are you going to recognize right and wrong and make your choices according to that? One is ego living and one is more in the true self living. In society there are some who are punished and lose their freedom for not having harmed another, while others who engage in harm against another are never acted upon and stopped. So you have people who say smoke weed, they didn't harm anybody but they get put in jail, and you have other people, crooks of society, big people in, in the establishment and politics and police and business, they do huge crimes, harm thousands of people, but they never get stopped. And they just keep going along. Different games. In order for someone to violate natural law, another must be violated or harmed, and then action can be taken against them to stop this harm. No imaginary rights can be invented or granted to individuals or groups where they did not exist for every other individual. For example, can you imagine giving someone a right you do not possess? If one person can't steal from others, who then can take from the labors of others? No one. No amount of people collected into a group can assume or grant such a right that does not exist. If 1,000 people don't have the right to take the labor of others by threats, which is what taxation is, then a group of these 1,000 people calling themselves government can't invent or assume a right that does not exist. Granting someone... Uh, sorry, granting something you do not possess yourself is an illusion. A right cannot be assumed if it does not already exist. So why can't we write laws into existence? So why can't we write laws into existence? Because we are not God. Man's law is irrelevant in light of the revelation and recognition of universal cosmic natural moral law. If man's law is in contradiction with natural law, it is false and immoral and not binding upon you. Otherwise, it is in harmony with natural law and is redundant. Next section, Consciousness as Natural Law Expressions. This chart is made by Mark Passio, explains the whole dynamic of life very accurately. And this is, I have to say, out of all Mark Passio's work, how amazing as it is in different aspects and different capacities, and it's so great, this is the most important work he's ever done. This is the most amazing thing that exp expresses life. You, I've learned the most from this, I think. It's just amazing what I've been able to build upon on my circle of life, infographic where I tie the trivium which has to do with how we live with natural law expressions which have to do with how we live and there's, there's a lot that I wouldn't know if it wasn't for Mark Passio and this is the most important infographic that you have to learn and then you can progress
The natural law expressions go through um, four main stages based on the initial polarity, either love or fear. So I've gone in, I have made my own natural law chart that is coupled with the trivium and levels of consciousness to explain this in different ways. Not the way Mark explains it, but using his his basic structure in a different way. So instead of the, the fifth one, uh, the last one on the bottom, instead of having five, I only have four. Well, I have three. Instead of the, the four main ones, after love and fear, I have three and then I conclude it with uh, the generating or manifesting with the good or chaos. So that, that chart I made, um, please understand how the natural law expressions are generated, which you can read a bit on on the previous article on consciousness and polarity. There we I talk about the initiative uh, expressions of knowledge and ignorance a bit. I go into sovereignty and confusion, freedom and control into more detail, and good and evil a bit. Now I'm going to go briefly over knowledge, ignorance, sovereignty, confusion, freedom and control. So if you want more, go to the previous article. It's shorter than this one, Consciousness and Polarity. Or you can listen to the audio. Or go back to Mark Passio's Podcast 36. And he has other podcasts which go into more things. But uh, I'll just basically expre uh, express it. You have love, and you can only stay in love. Only the generations of love start from love which isn't the, the touchy-feely love. Love is the expansion of consciousness, which is truth. So that's why I say truth is love, love is truth. Because truth leads to knowledge, sovereignty, freedom, chaos, and order. It's just love as the force, and fear is a force. So with love you have knowledge, which is seeking truth. And that's the initial thing. The initial expression from love is you'd have seeking truth. When you care for truth, you seek it. And you gain knowledge. From that knowledge, the internal expression that will develop inside of you is sovereignty. Self-governance, self-ownership, self-rulership, self-dominion. It's internal monarchy where you're the only one ruler. And from that you express externally as freedom, external anarchy. You don't control anybody. The only person you control is yourself. And as everyone does that, the generative expression in all of reality is going to be order and good, the heaven on earth. Conversely, in fear, it constricts consciousness, so instead of seeking truth, you refuse to look for truth. You're ignorant, and you're content in your ignorance. You think you know it all, possibly. You don't need to learn. Nature teaches you everything, etc., etc. A bunch of bullshit. God teaches you. La, 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 la. You don't need to learn. This leads to confusion. I lived with people like this. New Agers didn't want to learn. Nature taught them. They already knew. They read Wayne Dyer. Oh, Greg Braden. But they, when they'd speak, they wouldn't speak shit that made any sense. They wouldn't speak understanding. They would speak confusion. Because they were in an internal anarchy. Because they refused truth and they were ignorant. Maybe they weren't at external control because they were so right brain dominant that it wasn't much on the control. But usually, when you're in internal confusion, you seek to control externally. Because internally it's all a mess, it's all chaos and anarchy. But And then externally you try to create rules and restrictions and control everything because you're not in control internally. So it's a coping mechanism. And then as a result you have everyone trying to control everybody else because no one wants to control themselves. No one wants to learn about truth and morality. And then you end up with chaos and evil on the outside. So that's the natural law expression chart. In summary, um, Mark Passio does it in more detail. I express it in more text from Mark Passio's work in the previous article, Consciousness, Consciousness and Polarity, and I will progress in a little summary in the next few, I guess, six paragraphs, six to eight paragraphs, describing the natural law expressions a little bit. I won't go over my own natural law expressions chart, as everything is in text, and you can just read it yourself if you understand the trivium, a natural law, and you'll just see how it applies. So please read the addition, 
the previous article on consciousness and consciousness and polarity if you want more details than these short descriptions I'm about to give. So the generative forces, there are two basic polar forces available, available for us to choose from to generate or create what we manifest in reality, love or fear. Many people consider the two polar forces to be love and hate, but this is due to a certain perspective that lacks deeper understanding. Hate manifests from fear. The initiative expression, so knowledge is seeking truth. Knowledge from seeking truth. The initial expression of love through natural law is seeking truth and the desire to know, which eventually manifests as knowledge and understanding of certain truths. Love is the force that expands consciousness and wants us to look at the truth contained in reality, what is, and allow us to expand our consciousness awareness, our conscious awareness. Love is seeking truth. Love is truth. Ignorance, refusing truth, will make you ignorant. The opposite or negative initial expression of fear through natural law is the ignorance of not wanting to know and actively refusing knowledge and truth. Ignorance contracts conscious awareness. Ignorance is based in fear. Knowledge is based in love. Ignorance prevents an understanding of natural law and the root causal factors of our condition. Freedom comes with knowledge of truth and ignorance leads to enslavement. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Thomas Jefferson said that quote. People think they can be free and not seek truth. Well, they are. They don't even understand the dynamics of life. And they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, oh, I'm going to teach you how to enjoy life, because that's all it's focused on for them, is all pleasure gratification, enjoy life. They don't want to understand life properly. They don't want to delve deeply into truth and morality. No, they just want to enjoy life. So enjoy your lives, you ignorant idiots. I ain't wasting my time on you anymore. You're not even going to be listening to this audio. <laughs> There are essentially two states of rulership, a monarchy of one ruler or anarchy of no rulers. So this is the internal expressions. I don't, I don't remember if I mentioned that. The internal expression of the expansive force of consciousness manifests as internal monarchy. This is known as sovereignty, self-control, self-dominion, self-mastery, self-governance, self-ownership, and self-rulership of one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions. The contractive force of consciousness manifests internally as anarchy. A person is an oppositional duality consciousness that does not rule themselves and is not sovereign because they are in confusion due to ignorance of the truth. So the internal monarchy is sovereign. From Latin super, meaning above or over, and regnum, meaning rule or control. So you're above rule, you're above control of others only you control yourself. A sovereign is being a ruler over no other but our own kingdom, kingdom of self. Our thoughts, emotions, and actions are in unison, harmony, and non-duality. Our thoughts are in a state of intelligence. Our emotions are in a state of care. Our courage has given us, has given us the will to act in proper moral ways in the world. We become united, whole, and one within ourselves so that we are not in internal contradiction, opposition, conflict, etc. A sovereign exists in degrees as well because it is difficult to become a being that is completely unified with truth and act in harmony with it and themselves. Society is currently constructed to ensure we are not fully capable of uniting with the truth and ourselves by having us agree to live in a certain way that is contrary to principles of truth in order for us to survive in this current modality of living. So confusion comes from internal anarchy. Confusion is a state of being fractured and broken up internally as we are not in harmony and unison with ourselves. This condition is a result of not knowing and understanding what is going on inside of us because we have not looked at ourselves in full honesty and self-respect. We do not know our own psyche and consciousness and so we act and behave in contradiction to our thoughts and emotions which, has, which is an internal oppositional state of consciousness. Ignorance breeds confusion through a lack of acquisition of truths to bring greater clarity and understanding of one's life. 
acting against truth is the same as acting against ourselves because what is right, good, and true is what is best for us. Our freedom, prosperity, peace, and everything good. We are in opposition with our own self. Internal disorder creates external disorder. The internal is reflected onto the external through the hermetic principle of correspondence. The state of internal anarchy is someone not ruling themselves and their own house. A condition of internal confusion, opposition, contradiction, adversity, non-accordance, inconsistent, incoherent, incongruent, non-integrated, disunited, disharmony, and duality. The less we are in a capacity to rule ourselves, lack of knowledge, internal opposition, through attainment of truth to bring us the clarity and understanding to right action, uh, sorry, to make right action, decisions and choices, the more easily we can be manipulated from without into taking wrong action and choices. So the lack of knowledge, internal confusion, internal opposition is not going to enable you to make the right action choices and decisions because you're not going to have clarity you're going to be obfuscated in confusion truth is the way truth is love love is truth embrace truth care for truth yes that's my saying that's the slogan a slogan <laughs> a slogan or logo, <laughs> the slogo. It's the slogan on my website. Truth is love, love is truth, truth unites, lies divide. Embrace truth, care for truth. External expressions. The external expression of love and fear through natural law manifests as freedom and control in our lives. So first freedom is external anarchy. Freedom is external anarchy where no one, no one is the ruler of anyone else. There are neither masters nor slaves. Everyone has equal rights and expresses their consciousness by living in harmony with natural law principles of truth. No one accepts the false beliefs of ownership over another living being. There is no delusion of thinking one has the right to control the actions of others who are not violating the natural law rights of another living being, such as is currently manifested through the institutions of police, military, and government. Those who work for and support these institutions are violating natural law every day. Control is based in the force of fear that results from a contraction or limitation of consciousness. And this is control or external anarchy. I think I'm forgetting to read the subsections and I'm just reading the paragraphs, so I apologize. Consciousness is based in the force of fear that results from a contraction or limitation of consciousness. Consciousness is prevented from expanding through the force of love when people choose to willfully, to be willfully ignorant and refuse the truth. This creates a state of internal anarchy and confusion, leading to a desire to exercise external control over others. As more people accept a fear-based consciousness and desire control, this centralizes power and external monarchy manifests. We are heading into this one-world government of one external monarchic force ruling everybody. Next subsection manifestations of natural law in our world. By moving through each positive expression of the generative force of love, we arrive at the manifestation of order or everything we recognize and experience as good. Truth and love bring forward freedom, order, peace, harmony, and goodness. Love expands consciousness. And I'm not talking about romantic love or relationship love between friends and philos, familial love, and any of that. Oh, if you want more information on the love, I forgot to mention this in the previous audio on the previous article. I have an article, Truth is Love, with a three-hour, 40-minute audio explaining how truth is love. And how whenever you speak truth, it's always love. Unless you're purposely trying to hurt someone. But usually when you speak truth that hurts, you're trying to get people to wake up, face the mirror. So it is love. It is care. In that lower sense, 
And that's why love, as the higher sense, is the force that expands consciousness. Because when you start to actually care for people, care for morality, care for truth itself and morality itself, even apart from people, then you care for people, then you care for other beings that aren't human people, there are other, other persons, there are animals. That's what the force of love is. It's not, oh, I love you, you're my honey bun, oh, I love my children, oh, I love you, man. It's none of that. None of that. None of it. And this is what people are completely obsessed in, in in society. They're so attached to this personalized, personal feelings. They don't want to get attached to truth and morality. God forbid they'd have to actually delve deeply into that and understand that deeply and get a true joy from that depth of the true self, of reconnecting with the true self and truly developing self-love. It's amazing how people are completely ignorant of this. To continue, contrarily, using the force of fear to generate our experience through ignorance, confusion, and, and attempting to externally control others is the current condition we have manifested known as evil or chaos. Fear contracts consciousness. Fear puts consciousness into a grave. This condition can be changed by helping people to understand natural law principles. Using the positive generative polarity does not create any of the negative expressions. The ever-expansive force of consciousness known as love or truth can only create positive expressions. Embodying truth or love and expanding consciousness and expanding conscious awareness does not foster ignorance. It's impossible when you embody truth and love to foster ignorance. You might still have ignorance, but whenever it it's presented, you should care for truth in order to doubt and question and be curious about yourself to verify yourself con constantly. So you're not going to just keep fostering more and more ignorance. If you're looking for more and more truth and morality, eventually that search is going to reduce your ignorance. It's not going to increase it. Developing knowledge does not create internal confusion. Becoming a sovereign does not create external control. Living in freedom of anarchy and personal responsibility of self-governance and self-rulership does not manifest as chaos in the world. Believing we are generating from the force of love or truth while we actually manifest ignorance, internal opposition and confusion, or attempt to impose an external control on others, is an indication that we are actually generating from the force of fear, which is a contraction of consciousness and limitation of knowledge and understanding. Desiring control, being in internal opposition and confusion with oneself or the truth, and willfully ignoring truth, are due to a lack of attaining certain truths that would bring one to an understanding of the importance of aligning with truth and what manifests as a result. Employing a particular generative force will create the relative expressions with respect to that force and not the opposite. These are polarized principles because they work in mutually exclusive ways. This is how natural law and life function. Understanding this deeply will resonate with our core being and we will recognize the veracity of natural law and how it operates in our daily life to manifest the conditions we experience. This is the real law of attraction, not the new age one as espoused in the secret, where you only have to imagine something and then it will manifest. That is not the way it works. But so many people have bought into the new age, feel good, believe whatever you want deception. Actions and behaviors seem to fly out the window in terms of importance to those who want to deny their involvement in wrong and bullshit that keeps us from going forward in evolving consciousness together. They want to play their little mind games, use some flawed foundational premises for logical confusions, imitate animal behavior, imitate caveman behavior, and other absurdities that are not foundational principles of truth by which to base right action upon and live our lives according to. Choosing to align ourselves with the expansive force of consciousness, which is love and truth, is how we manifest what is right, good, and true, which is what we should want to create 
instead of our current condition resulting from fear, ignorance, confusion, and control. Love embraces truth. Fear rejects truth. Evolving consciousness is embracing truth. Increasing our conscious awareness expands our consciousness and our embodiment of love and truth. Truth leads to greater love and care to expand and evolve consciousness through acquiring more truth that continues to expand that force that feeds back on itself to perpetually grow and evolve as long as we have the will to do so and choose to remain in alignment with that force. That's what I'm talking about in previous articles on solipsism and truth. That as long as you're aligned with that force, you're going to keep growing and feeding back and evolving. If you step out of that force and you step out of the care for truth and you step out of seeking for truth, you are stepping back into another coffin. It might not be that first coffin that everyone else is dead and asleep and unawake and unbegun and uninitiated uninitiate, and in. So you might have begun, you might have been initiated, you might have been awakened, but you chose to step off the path, stop learning, stop seeking truth, stop caring for truth and morality deeply, and you're just back, tent pitching, back in the coffin. Because that's what a tent pitcher is, is a secondary coffin. It's not the first one that you woke up from, but you decided, well, uh -huh, I'm going to go back in the coffin. I don't remember where I was, but let's go here. Increasing our conscious awareness expands our consciousness and our embodiment of truth and love. Truth leads to greater love and care to expand and evolve consciousness through acquiring more truth that continues to expand that force that feeds back on itself to perpetually grow and evolve as long as we have the will to do so and choose to remain in, al in alignment with that force. There you go, I read it again to make it clear. The Kaibalion expresses this understanding in similar words as well, describing it in aspects of alchemical transmutation. So, and it is this fact that enables the Hermeticist to transmute one mental state into another, along the lines of polarization. Things belonging to different classes cannot be transmuted into each other. But things of the same class may be changed, that is, may have their polarity changed. So if you're looking at, I don't know, I'd have to rethink about this. I'm not going to give an example. And then to continue further in the paragraph or later on in, in the page. And it will also be noticed that even when, to those unfamiliar with the principles of vibration, the positive pull seems to be of a higher degree than the negative, and re readily dominates it. The tendency of nature is in the direction of the dominant activity of the positive pole. So in life, we're always seeking truth, even if we're currently conditioned to reject it in our embodiment of the false selves, living in falsity. But we're always supposed to go to the positive pole. Always. So when you step off of seeking that positive pole, when you tent pitch, you're going back in the grave. You're not going towards the positive pole. You need will to go somewhere. You gotta want it. Or else you stagnate entropy and then it's just frozen nothingness. You gotta move. Action. That's why people anthropomorphize a creator as having a will. Do I know or not? I don't know. No one knows the, the creative aspect. These are just symbols and words we use to try to express things that we conceptualize about reality. So we have a will and we're made in the image of God, so God has a will. Well, that's the, the inference we make. So the will of creation is always to go towards the positive. The will of nature, the tendency of nature is always to go towards the positive. Everything's active. Everything's active at the molecular level. Everything's active at the, uh, at the atomic level, I mean. Everything's moving, it's all moving, it's all activity. It's not activity at a higher order state, where things exist for themselves in their own wills. But as a universal will, you could say that that's what drives everything to keep moving. And if it wasn't for that will to keep moving, then everything would stagnate, entropize, and freeze. It would just be nothing and dead. So you need the will to make things move. So that's, anyways, 
I say it's all anthropomorphization because the only way we can relate these things is to relate it to ourselves. We're always using ourselves as a mirror in comparison when we're trying to describe something that is completely beyond us. So all we have are fragments of images to try to describe this undescribable force, you know? The closest thing I can come to is it is truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law, true self, higher self, higher will. In my conceptualization, my understanding of reality, and my understanding of, of what our purpose is, what we're supposed to do, what's right, this is what I've come to understand. And I found correspondences in Plato, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, and this is what's referred to as the transcendental beings. But I came up with this understanding even before. I haven't even read Aristotle. I haven't read Plato. I haven't read Aquinas. I've only read a little bit of things in my research that confirms what I'm thinking of is what other people have already thought of before. And trying to understand causality, the original causality, and where things come from. It is speculative, but it is based in logic, based on what we have now as information to deduce or induce other aspects of reality based on that. Is it a hundred percent? Can it be proven? Not really, but the principles, the seven hermetic principles, they can be detected and seen. So then where do they come from? There's always a where does this come from? Where does that come from? Well, originally, there's an unmoved mover, and we're always trying to explain this as the original causer. Something comes from somewhere. It's not uh, an infinite regressive loop that loops back on itself, and then we created the universe. <laughs> you know, there, there would be no answer there. So there's something somewhere, we speculate, that creates everything. Anyways, this is... A, I've been talking for 10 minutes or something on a completely side topic or whatever. To continue, note the class aspect that is mentioned is what I am talking about in my dualistic conceptual framework, represented by the frequency of truth, love, good, etc., for understanding and navigating reality. Dualities are polarities. Class is what is being used to as a measurement for, uh, as a basis for measurement, that is to say, truth, love, good, etc., there are varying degrees of truth and less truth in the form of falsity, wrong, etc. Please read what I wrote about this framework to understand more of what I am talking about, and it will also create more correspondences and connections for a bigger picture holistic understanding. So I'm talking about when I read the Kaibalian quote, where things belonging to different classes cannot be transmuted to each other, but things of the same class may be changed, that is, may have their polarity changed. So when you took, when you look into metaphysics as well, the the classes would be the kind. So you'd have a, a class of animal. Or no, the species, the genera of animal, and then man would be the class or species, and then you'd have me or you or anybody else, and you'd have animal, and then you'd have another class, uh, cats, so my, my cat companion here, Luna, well, she's a, she's another, she's a part of a different class, a part of the same genera of animals. That's, that's confusing things, I'm just relating it to metaphysics. So in the class that I'm talking about in the dualistic conceptual framework, I really should have elaborated on this paragraph because I wrote this a long time ago and I don't really remember what I was saying. Um, I'd have to go look at my dualistic conceptual framework again, I think. So the class would be truth or falsity, love or fear, good or evil. So you can pull, you can transmute within a class. So that's, if you go back to the natural law chart, that's within the polarity of love. You can only progress in that polarity. And that's, that's basically what I mean. That class of love, you can only progress in that class. You can change from fear to love, but you can't go from love into ignorance, and you can't go from fear into sovereignty. you got to start from the polarity, and you got to change from the initial expression 
from the negative to the positive and then start from from the beginning. We have the choice to align with varying degrees of love or fear. This determines the quality of our collective shared experience as we co-create and manifest in reality through the totality of our actions, behaviors, and ways of being of each individual. This is the real way we create our reality that we choose to live in, not the New Age notion that you yourself create your own world reality and can manifest whatever you want. Truth is always truth, no matter the false beliefs and perceptions someone has about what is reality. Realize, realize, realize. Now, <laughs> you probably didn't hear that, but it's real eyes, realize, real lies. I don't know if that comes from Tupac or whatever. That's a good little phrase. You gotta have the, the right vision, the right capacity to see the lies. Aligning perceptions with reality is right, good, and true, and expands consciousness, the force of love. Trying to be a god to force reality to conform to our erroneous belief constructs is false, wrong, and leads to badness created by ourselves, such as the current collective condition of the beings living on our planet. We did it to ourselves and to others. We all experience and perceive reality in varying degrees of relative similarity and difference to identify and recognize what is, but at the core of it all is all, uh, sorry, but at the core of it all is the same thing, the truth, what is, reality, only it is being viewed from different angles. This does not mean all perceptions are valid and true. We have two realities in our current manifested experience in the universe. The manifestation of the universe as it is, and that of conceptual frameworks and belief constructs to evaluate and assess, discern and judge what we are experiencing. I would just like to say there's the reality as it is, which is the territory, and then there's our conceptual frameworks and our bullshit beliefs that try to make sense of the reality and the territory which becomes our map for navigating the territory which is why I called my dualistic conceptual framework what is used for perceiving, conceiving, understanding and navigating reality because these conceptual frameworks are our map and if you have a faulty conceptual framework which 100% of the people on this planet have, even me, I still have some, I'm sure. But 99.999999% of the people on this planet aren't even aware of their corrupted conceptual frameworks even existing within them. And they aren't even aware that, that there's a need to do work to remove them. So I don't exclude myself from still probably having them but at least I'm not part of the ignorant masses who is unaware of the need to even do the work to remove false belief constructs and refine our conceptual frameworks to make sure they're not contradictory. That's what I do. I make sure my conceptual frameworks are non-contradictory and that they do flow from one thing to the other and it makes sense. This does not mean all perceptions are valid and true. We have two realities in our current manifested experience in the universe. The manifestation of the universe as it is, and that of... Oh, I already read this. Sorry. I was uh, highlighting something. So I'll go back. So the, the manifestation of the universe as it is, and that of conceptual frameworks and belief constructs to evaluate, assess, discern, and judge what we are experiencing. Our way of perceiving the way we live and operate in the 3D physical reality is shaped by how we perceive ourselves and the external world and, uh, and others. If we are manipulated into accepting and buying into lies and deceptions, then our way of looking at ourselves and the world will be altered from alignment with an accurate perception of reality as it truly is. We create illusions of fantasy to live in. This is some serious magic of mind control going on. Our course in life is then being guided by unseen hands 
manipulating our consciousness because we are ignorant of how we function and ignorant of the importance of aligning with truth and natural law principles. The way we can potentially individually create our own reality is when we accept degrees of fantasy illusions based on deception and falsehood. That is called a reality, that is called a reality bubble of living in a make-believe world, of believing whatever you want or wish to be true. Solipsism is home to that modality of consciousness and is not based in reality and the truth of what is. That is inventing our own reality that only we ourselves can break free from because only we are the ones who accept the beliefs that shape our way of perceiving things. These are self-imposed self delusions. They are ultimately self-imposed chains that prevent us from facing the truth of reality, instead preferring to feel good and comfortable about our current way of living based in deception. None of this changes the actual objective reality that exists. Alignment with reality is the key, not attempting to force reality to comply to our preconceived notions and, co and concepts of how we want or wish things to be, but acting in the wisdom of right action to manifest the change and betterment that can be. The next section is right and wrong. Understanding natural law enables a deeper level of comprehension of the objective difference between what is right and what is wrong, between what is true and what is false. Unfortunately, most people have a hard time distinguishing the difference between, sorry, unfortunately, most people have a hard time distinguishing the difference because of the degree of moral relativism in our civilization. So what is right equals correct, equals true, equals moral, equals moral, uh, equals natural law, equals do no harm, equals good. So you see how right is expressed in an apophatic of doing no harm, and that's good. Whatever you do no harm, that is good. What's wrong is incorrect, and it's false, and it's immoral, and it's not natural law, because it harms someone, and that is bad. It's evil. What is right is correct, accurate, true, moral, and based in natural law with no result in harm. What is wrong is incorrect, inaccurate, false, immoral, and not based in natural law, which does harm. Right, good, and true brings the clarity of understanding. Wrong, bad, and false brings the obfuscation of confusion. Something based in truth can be represented, th can be represented through the words right, correct, accurate, etc. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true, right, correct, accurate, etc. Right is also used to represent moral action. That was the right decision to make. A decision or action is right and moral, and moral when it is based in natural law and not harming another living being. Actions are right to take when they do not result in harm. Conversely, wrong is associated with what is not true, such as 2 plus 2 equals 5, which is false, wrong, incorrect, inaccurate, etc. An action someone does not have the right to take is a wrong action because they, it results in harm to another living being. A right is most easily understood in the negative apophatic sense to demonstrate that we do not have a right to do, uh, sorry, what we do not, to demonstrate what we do not have a right to do because there are far too many actions which do not result in any harm to bother listing them all. You're going to list the million trillion ways that you cannot do harm, or you're going to find out the ways that you can do harm and define it that way. So this is one way that the definition in the positive isn't completely accurate, because you can gain much more accurate understanding through defining natural moral law in the apophatic sense in terms of what you don't have the right to do, and what does not cause harm. That's the best way to understand natural moral law, I think, because understanding falsity and evil is pivotal to understanding morality. I've demonstrated this in falsity and evil, and in falsity and evil addendum on neutrality, are other articles that you can look into. To continue, understanding what we do not have a right to do 
enables us to understand what we do have a right to do. Defining what we do have, what we do not have a right to do, enables us to understand and affirm what we do have a right to do. It is simple to understand once you have all the pieces to construct the puzzle or paint an accurate picture. Something based in truth is based in principles, natural law, and will not result in harm. Something based in non-truth or falsehood is not based in principles of natural law and will result in harm. The simplicity of how this functions can only be expressed and spoken about. We cannot force anyone to accept it if they are not at a level of conscious awareness to be able to understand it. You can't stick a needle in someone's arm and inject them with the understanding of natural law. You can't shine a light in their face and have them all of a sudden come to a satori awakening. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes effort. It takes the desire for care. Uh, the desire and care for truth and morality. And without that, you're never going to learn. To test if an action is in compliance with natural law, imagine this scenario where there are only two people, such as the previous law and tax example. An action that is wrong for one being to take against another is the same as one person or group of people having the right to take that same action in a world of 7 billion people. A conscience is the ability to distinguish right from wrong, from the Latin com, meaning together, and sir, to know, or siere, to know, and understand. Conscience is to, uh, is to know together, to be mutually aware of. I've gone into greater detail in the article, Axioms, Existence, Conscience, and Identity, and in... Tracing Reality, A Visionary Quest of Wisdom, and Characters in Our Character, you'll find conscience and consciousness in one of those three. Conscience is to know together, to be mutually aware of. In other words, it is common sense knowledge, a sense of right and wrong that we all share in common. Yes, as a true self, we are all the same self and we all share that in common. And that's to come into the future after I do my natural law on the conception of true self and all that jazz. We're supposed to recognize right and wrong by having a developed conscience by our conditioning, but our conditioning into falsehood, deceptions, and believing fantasy as reality distorts our innate capabilities to align ourselves with what is right instead of what is wrong. Here I have a quote from Richard Weatherwill, sorry, Richard Weatherill from the book Right as Might, page 23, and I read this in, I think, the article on truth. Under analysis, a person discovers that situations consist of elements, some of which are wrong and others right. If he sorts out and examines those elements, truth is easily separated from error. This is the process of non-contradictory validation. That's my interjection. To continue with Weatherill's quote, Some tasks of sorting are more difficult than others, but only because they are more complicated. They have more elements, therefore they, are, they take more time to analyze, or perhaps the individual lacks knowledge of how to deal with them. So again, we need time. If you don't put in the time, you're not going to be able to remove contradictions. You're going to be living in confusion forever. Often it is hard to collect all the pertinent facts. Some facts may be filled in by speculation, and here it is important that the speculation be done by a scrupulous person. If those analyses are continued long enough, there finally emerges a clear pattern of distinction between right and wrong. Those who act before a clear pattern emerges, emerges are the persons whose irresponsibility is causing much of society's trouble, which is 99% of the people who do not care for truth, who do not seek truth, who do not seek to understand more, who are living in confusion and are allowing external control to run rampant because they're in confusion and they're in fear. They're in fear created from their own confusion and they're in complete fear of truth, which is why they ignore truth because they're apathetic towards truth and it leaves them to be cowardice in living in truth and lazy in living in truth. So they don't live in truth because they're lazy, cowards, apathetic, and ignorant because they fear truth. They don't want to look into truth. 
Because once you love truth, once you care for truth, once you understand, understand that truth is love and love is truth, well, guess what? You're not in that fear of polarity anymore. You're not going to be rejecting truth. And that's why I know everyone who rejects the deeper morality of the animal issue does not truly care for truth and morality and other beings. They do not. If they did, they would not be refusing the truth. They would not be apathetic towards truth, morality, and other beings. They would not be cowards refusing to change their behaviors because it's more comfortable to continue perpetuating the same violence and evil you've always been doing because you've been indoctrinated as an order follower to just be follow orders and do what your parents told you to do because that's what they've done. When are you going to start to think for yourself truly and really give a shit about truth? Really, really, really care deeply about truth and morality and other beings. Because that's what it leads to. It's not about, oh, I'm just going to care about truth and morality and fuck everyone in the world. No. It leads to caring more about yourself and other beings. First, you do have to have a certain level of self-love to care for truth. But then when you care for truth and morality, you start to care more about yourself because you care more about other beings too. And then you care more about yourself. And it's a feedback loop. And, and you just keep caring more. More self-love and more love for other beings that are innocent and have no right to have harm imposed against them. So the next section, is force the same as violence? There is obfuscation and confusion perpetuating society regarding what, regarding what force means and how that differs from violence. This confusion leads to an inhibition and pacification of the sacred masculine principle of self-defense in alignment with natural law. What is force? It's a strength or energy. It's exerting against something that resists. What is violence? It's a force exerted for the purpose of violating, damaging, or abusing. It's an unjust exercise of force. So clearly, we already see a, a difference between force and violence. When you use violence, you use force. Duh. But it doesn't mean force is violence. You can force people against their will volition. Forcibly hurt them, take from them, etc. You can also apply force to a ball to make it move build a house, etc. The difference is one is violent against someone's violation. Ah, sorry, against someone's volition. So the difference is one is violent against someone's volition, their will, making it a violation. Force in itself is not violent. It is just a force that creates a change in, a, in, in position in a state. You, something has to change for a force to work. It moves from position A to position B. Uh, the, the state changes in some way. This is how the universe exists. Without force, there is nothing. This is how we move our bodies, how we get any work done, etc. Note the root of violence is and violation. That is viol. Viol is viol in, in French, and that's rape. So you see, a violation is where violence comes from. If there's nothing violated, then there's no violence. The Latin word violar, violate, dishonor, outrage. Note we have violar linked to violation. Violar is in turn derived from the Latin and Italian Portuguese Spanish word of vis, V-I-S, which is force and strength. Note, force is not derived from violence, but violence is derived from force. Violation, violar, from vis. It's not vis comes from violar. It's not force comes from violence. No, violence comes from force. It's a specific type of force. Not force is violence. No, violence is a force. But it's a specific type of force. It's a violation force. That's why it's a violence. Violence is derived from force. This is important to understand. Violence requires force. Force does not require violence. So if someone initiates violence against someone out of the blue for no reason and against natural law, they are acting in violence against someone's 
volition, they are acting in a way to violate their natural law rights. So anything that has volition can be violated. I'll repeat that again. Anything that has volition can be violated. Only animals have volition. Animals go where they want, they move around, they do what they want. They have limited lives compared to us, but they do what they want. They have will. They have free will. Maybe not as powerful of a free will as us. They don't have hands and they can't create like us. They don't have the same bodies as us in order to enable the, physio uh, the consciousness manifestations expressed through our physiology to create a fork and spoon and all these other things and computers. They don't have the creative capacities that our free will allows us. But they do have free will. When someone uses force against another who is violating with violence another being's volition and rights, that first person is not being violent. They are correcting a violent act against natural law rights with the use of force. You are indeed exerting against something that resists. Sorry, I had to make a correction there. You are indeed exerting against something that resists, which may result in damaging effects, but you are not violating the violence, the evil. So yeah, you might damage the person who's a violence, so you want to call that violence because you're damaging them? Well, sometimes you have to damage people to make them stop doing evil. So you want to call that violence? Wrong. When you're putting a stop to violence and you're using force, it's not violence. It's force. Even if you cause damage to the other person, you're not violating their rights. They chose to violate someone else. You violate another being, you abandon your rights. You're saying, I am I no longer have rights. I'm choosing to abandon my rights by my willful choice to violate the rights of another being. I'm using violence to violate them. Then I don't have the rights to not be violated, when force is used against me to stop my violence, then that is simply force. It's not a violation against me. It's not violence. It's force to stop my violence. Big difference. Big uh, clarification that people need to understand. It is just a use of power, energy, and strength. The initiator of violence using unjust against natural law rights force is the one violating and being violent. That is also a violation of the sacred feminine principle of non-violence and non-aggression. Using force to stop that violence is not violence, but right action based in natural moral law to stop a wrongdoing from continuing unabated. This is the sacred masculine being rightfully used to defend and uphold the sacred feminine. It does matter who initiates the first act which they did not have a right to take. They are the initiators of violence, the undue use of force, violating someone else's free will and volition to not be harmed. The sacred feminine is being crushed, destroyed, broken, etc., and the sacred masculine needs to step in to set right action into manifestation. When someone violates someone else's rights, they lose their own rights. If you choose to violate someone's natural law rights, you are giving up your own rights under natural law. So I don't remember if I read this. I'm just going to reread it because it's important. I know I read this first two sentences, but I don't know if I read the paragraph. It does matter who initiates the first act which they did not have a right to take. They are the initiators of the violence, the undue use of force, violating someone else's free will and volition to not be harmed. The sacred feminine is being crushed, destroyed, broken, etc., and the sacred mes masculine needs to step in to set right action into manifestation. When someone violates someone else's rights, they lose their own rights. If you choose to violate someone's natural law rights, 
you are giving up your own rights under natural law. Force is protecting and defending natural law rights against a violation of those rights. Dark occultists, dominators, and controllers don't want people to step up and physically defend themselves against being violated. They want to pacify the sacred masculine of self-defense. Our current society's growing police state is demonstrated by Alex Jones and others, where we see state-sanctioned thugs using violence against those who exercise their right to free speech. This is the case uh, at the G8 and G20 sum summit protests. There are people who protest the political scheming of the power structures in the world and are harassed, pepper sprayed, tasered, or beaten for exercising the force of their voice and speaking information that people should know about. We have failed in our personal responsibility. We have not morally educated our young, so there happens to be criminal tendencies that develop in various people, and then we demand a controller clean things up in society because we don't want to handle it ourselves. We have handed over our personal responsibility by creating institutions and forces of control because we don't want to deal with our own house or be bothered and hassled by the problems around us. So people or groups end up with imaginary rights that no one possesses, such as stealing through taxation, violence and coercion that results from non-compliance with taxation, or other dictates of man's law that are not followed, and it is all sanctioned through tacit acceptance into indentured servitude. Proper education is key, not the fear and need to control by having institutions of control to save us from our own ignorance. That's why we need to evolve consciousness to have people to change, not use police to force everyone to control, and oh, you got to pay taxes, and you got to do this, and you can't throw your gum here on the ground, we're going to send you, put you in a cage, you can't smoke a joint, we're going to put you in jail for two years. It's, it's all insanity to try to control people to make them do what's right. People have to learn to do what's right. They have to learn it. You can't, you can't just beat a stick on them and try to make them do things that are better for themselves. And you sure as hell can't beat them with a stick when they're not doing any harm. We're just we live in insanity. Force is voluntary based on natural law and morality to take an action that one has the right to take because it does not violate the natural law rights of another sentient animate being. The sacred feminine principles of non-violence and non-aggression is being sustained, aligned with, and embodied. Violence is coercive action not based on natural law and morality to take an action one doesn't have the right to take because they are violating the rights of another sentient animate being stepping on the sacred feminine without care. Another topic is the difference between killing and murder. Let me know if you have objections to the definitions I have set forth as they make sense when you trace back their original meaning that they are used that they are to be used to represent. The next section is, is killing the same as murder. To murder is to kill, but to kill is not necessarily to murder. It's the same direction as is applied with force and violence. Force, violence is force, but force is not necessarily violence. So killing versus murder. I have some etymology for terms such as kill, quell, kill and quell, and tutor. Uh, kill is to end a life. Interestingly, tu, tuer in French means to kill. It comes from Latin tutor meaning I guard and I protect. So to kill and not murder is to guard and protect. It's right in the etymology. When you're killing something, it's to guard and protect. You're defending. That's what it's supposed to be, to end a life lawfully, which we're going to get into. It would seem to kill, to in French, derives from guard, protect, defending. We can infer that killing is only killing when it is used to guard, protect, or defend oneself, whereas murder is not. This is the causal factor initiator of violence versus defense against an aggressor, defense against an initiator of violence. So murder, I have some etymology links here. Murder is unlawful killing. From the Proto-Indo-European root, M-R-T-R-O, and from the root mer, to die. I guess I'd do the same root as the C, Maya, M-E-R is Maya, the C. 
So to die. Murderers to die. So in which law is it unlawful to murder? Natural law. When you kill, it's within the law because you're protecting and defending. When you murder, you're killing outside of the law on someone who did no wrong. No harm, no violation. So, in which law? Natural law. That's the law. It's unlawful to violate. You can't murder. Murder is a violation of the law, the natural law. There is such a thing as lawful killing in natural law. When the sacred feminine is disregarded, non-violence and non-aggression are violated, and someone violates another to the point where they try to end their life, the self-defense of the sacred feminine, uh, sorry, the self-defense of the sacred masculine is allowed to use force to end that unlawful violence and violation of rights to whatever force necessary to end that violence, uh, with whatever force necessary to end that violence. Further validation comes from the Old Testament Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, the translation of thou shalt not kill is intentionally false, as it is really thou shalt not murder. Even in the Strong's Concordance, they have, um, even in the Strong's Concordance, they do not want you to understand this truth fully. So in Exodus 20.13, thou shalt not kill. So that's uh, Strong's Concordance. H7523, and that's Rotsak, and that's essentially the consonants R and T, no, T, Z, T, Z, and H. So R, T, Z, H, and that's uh, Rotsak. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. So it's a primitive root, root properly to dash in pieces. So you can see cutting into pieces, killing. That is kill. A human being, especially to murder. So it's especially to murder. It's not just kill. It's especially to murder. To put to death, kill, slay, murder. So you see, put to death, kill, slay, murder. It's not just put to death. In defense, it's not just kill in defense, it's you're putting to death someone who doesn't have the right to be put to death. You're murdering it, you're putting it to death, you're slaying it. You don't have a right, it has its right to life. So it's, it's a murder. It's a violation of natural law, because you had no right to take it. In a dictionary that uses etymology, we can see the difference between kill and murder again. So I have a Wiktionary link to the, I think it's the, the Strong's Concordance. To murder, to deliberately kill. Murder, the crime of deliberately killing. So again, it's deliberate, deliberate, deliberate. I'm not talking about deliberate when someone's trying to kill you and then you're going to defend yourself and then you're going to deliberately kill them in order for them to not kill you. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the initiator of violence against someone who did them no harm and trying to kill them. That's a deliberate killing and that's a murder. That's the real meaning of the Hebrew word. Killing isn't necessarily immoral. We can kill in self-defense if it comes to that. Murder is a form of killing, but it is immoral and there is no right to do so. The sacred feminine principle of non-aggression and non-violence has to be violated, a violation of rights, a violation of natural law, in order for self-defense to be enacted. Murder is initiation of violence by taking another's life that caused no harm to anyone, did no aggression or violence towards another being. Killing is a causal response, self-defense of the sacred masculine, to an effect and violation brought upon you or against your will, the violation of the sacred feminine, non-aggression, and non-violence. Understanding the applicability of universal cosmic natural law for our entire sentient animate being, uh, for our nature of sentient animate beings is different than the laws of other sentient animate beings. We have a unique element of consciousness where we can create things that do not previously exist 
for the better, or currently for the worst, it seems. And this is the great power to do good or evil. With great power comes great responsibility. We have great power to affect the external world. Our actions and behaviors collectively produce the ways in which we live on this planet. We have morality with our manifestations of consciousness. Actions have consequences. We can and must learn the cause and effect mechanism to natural law to recognize right from wrong and live as moral beings. Our actions and behaviors towards other innocent sentient animate beings are a part of us, and universal cosmic natural moral law applies in everything we do. If we enslave other innocent sentient animate beings, then we are not truly living and embodying natural law, higher self, higher will, truth, love, good, right, etc. If you think your actions of support, consent, and participation in the enslavement, exploitation, harm, suffering, violence, or murder of other innocent sentient animate beings is not part of what you do and what you are currently choosing to be, then you do not understand yourself or natural moral law. We can create wonderful good, and we can also create tremendous evil. There are also grades in between. And go see my dualistic conceptual framework presentation to understand more on that. So long as we embody aspects of wrongdoings and evil towards other innocent sentient animate beings, we are mere, merely living in partial embodiment of natural law and are still supporters of slavery. Only truth can allow you to cross the divide of apathy, ignorance, cowardice, and denial about what you participate, support, and consent to in your actions and behaviors. Our minds are powerful, and we can delude ourselves about what we are actually participating in. We are very good at lying to ourselves, better than our ability to lie to others. It is time to let go of illusions by seeking out and embracing the truth in all matters. Murder and enslavement of human actions applies to all sentient animate beings. The laws of cause and effect, karma and behavioral consequence are specific universal cosmic natural moral laws that apply to human beings alone. According to our nature as a species, just as other species have their own laws. We are not meant to imitate other animals. We have our own path as they have theirs. Our path includes morality, knowing and living by what is right and wrong, to become more integrated, awakened, self-actualized, self-realized, self-governed, sovereign beings living in true freedom and prosperity on this planet and universe. Next section, responsibility, our responsibility. Our ability to respond is enhanced by becoming more of a sovereign being. A sovereign, self-governed, self-ruled, and self-controlled person takes personal responsibility over their thoughts, emotions, and actions, which are the only things we have a right to control. Creating institutions of power and control to govern our lives and do things for us is abdication of personal responsibility. Taking personal responsibility for, for our thoughts, emotions, and actions is the basis for discovering and understanding natural law. We have to be honest with ourselves to face what we are currently choosing to be through the three manifestations of consciousness. Taking a paycheck to violate other people's rights is not acceptable. Currently, our economic system and basis for survival promotes such positions to be filled in, to be filled in order to survive. But it is not simply just a matter of doing a job. Following orders is not an excuse for violating, violating the natural law rights of others when you do not have a right to do that. So Gerald, Gerald Massey said, They must find it difficult, those who have taken authority as truth, rather than truth as authority. That's a big problem on the world. People don't care about truth and morality. Once you do, you get to understand this, and you can delve deeper into more levels of truth and morality, rather than keep denying it and rejecting it. And even if you tell yourself you believe that truth is the authority, then why don't you seek truth and morality more? Why are you constantly rejecting facts that are coming out in the medical establishment? Facts about diet and health. No, no, you want to make up lies in order to validate your current behavior and justify your actions of immorality against other non-human animals. You don't care about truth. Your authority is you. You're being the God, the arbiter of truth in your own life to dictate 
what actions are right and wrong. You don't care about right and wrong objectively. You don't care about morality and truth. Really, deep down, no, you don't. You still need more love. What I mean is you need more care for truth. You need more self-love. You need more of that force of love, which is truth. You need to care for truth and love. Uh, for, you need to care for truth and morality more in order to understand the depths of how you are failing morally because you don't have the truth, because you're rejecting it, because you're in fear of it, because you don't want to change your ways, because you don't want to admit how you're in participating in evil and immorality. So anything you can do to reject it and deny facts about reality is what you will do because you do not actually care for truth and morality. Because truth and morality is not your authority in life. It is mine. It is my capital. It's the most important thing in my life is truth and morality. And it is what di di dictates what I do. I try to align myself every day more and more with truth and morality. This same story has happened many times in our recent history and further back. There are those who accept claims of authority over other living beings and usurp their natural law rights. Soviet Russia, Nazi Germany, and going back every century into the Roman times, and even before that, there have always been people who have claimed imaginary rights of authority over others. Those who line up and take orders are automatons, imagining that they can give up their personal responsibility for the wrong actions they commit and claim it's all just a job and they are just following orders. Excuses, justifications, and defensive rationalizations are always employed by those who need to validate their wrongs they are engaged in. People want to claim that they are not responsible for what happens as a result of their actions, but the truth is that they are. But the truth is that they are. They simply want to be irresponsible so that they can continue doing what they are doing without pointing the finger at themselves. Instead, pointing the finger at someone else and claiming someone else is responsible for their behavior. And it's the same thing I've had in talking about the animal issue and veganism. People want to claim that, oh, well, uh, that doesn't make me immoral, that doesn't make me bad, and da da da. They just want to avoid taking personal responsibility. That's all it is. They don't want to take personal responsibility for their actions because they don't want to face the mirror and admit what they're actually engaging in is wrong and it makes them wrong because they're all trapped in ego. They can't admit that they're wrong because if you could admit that you were wrong, then you would possibly be able to admit that what you're engaging in is wrong, but you can't. So you engage in justifications and excuses ad infinitum going in circles and circles just so you don't have to admit that what you're doing is wrong because you can't face yourself in the mirror because you don't have the self-love to admit when you're doing something bad because you're so weak inside. Because if you did have the self-love, anything bad that you do, you'd be readily able to admit, you'd be willing to look into it, because you do have the self-love and the courage and the self-honesty and the self-responsibility to want to know the self-knowledge, to want to know knowledge about yourself, about how corrupted you are, how evil you are, how immoral you are. But since you, care, since you have apathy for truth, you're ignorant for truth, and you fear truth, and you're a coward for truth, and you're lazy for truth, and you won't live in it. Because you don't want to be responsible. You don't want that self-responsibility. So what do you need? You need to learn more. More self-knowledge. More self-love. Have courage to face yourself in the mirror. If you're not facing yourself in the mirror, you don't have courage. You're a coward. Welcome to 99% of the world and 99% of the truth movement. People who don't really care about truth and morality, who are cowards, can't point the finger at themselves, can't look at their behavior honestly, can't look at their actions honestly to see what they're objectively doing. They just want to keep doing it, create justifications and excuses, and just do it forever. Here's a quote from David Icke. Accept re responsibility for yourself and your actions, thoughts, and words. You alone make choices. You alone are answerable to the consequences of your behavior. The feeble excuse that your boss required it, the establishment expected it, holds no truth or justification. What is the point of having principles if you allow others to dictate your behavior? At the end of the day, you will judge your performance and the contrib 
contribution you have made to creation. It will not be based on what another expected of you or what you did because you felt trapped. Following orders isn't going to be the way you're going to judge yourself and how you contributed to making things better. Just because, oh, well, uh, someone expected it of me. It was part of my job. Um, I, I felt trapped. I had to do it. No. You chose to do it. There's no excuse. Deal with what you chose to create into reality. Deal with blowing up a child's face in their crib with a flashbang. Deal with shooting rubber bullets and blinding people. Not that you even give a shit, because you you justify everything you do as right, good, and true, even though it's ev evil, immoral, and wrong. Because you don't have the courage to face yourself in the mirror. Every time an action comes up against the mirror of your behavior and actions, Sorry, every, any time the truth and morality comes up against the mirror of your behavior and actions, you close the mirror and immediately reject, deny, refuse, dismiss, and excuse, justify your actions. Because you can't face yourself in the mirror. Because you don't have self-love. You don't have the courage to face yourself. Here comes truth and morality. Holy crap, I better run the other direction continue to be irresponsible. That's everyone in my life. They think the response, oh, I feed my kid, and I have a kid, and I have a job, and I have a car, and la 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 la. Do you still care about truth and morality? Oh, but I'm learning about health and food, and da 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 da. If you still don't care about truth and morality, all you're doing is basing your information on the corrupted medical establishment of lies, and oh, meat's good, and everything's good, so... I don't need to change my ways because I don't have to. I don't actually think for myself and care for truth and morality to actually dig into information. I'm just going to accept the research from the medical establishment. Thank you very much. Go back to sleep. We have free will to choose to integrate with the current system we are living in, or to refuse to cooperate with a system that is enslaving people. We either do not follow natural law, or we follow natural law regardless of the deceptions people are living in. The responsibility lies on our shoulders each one of us as an individual in the way out of our current condition of suffering. We need to understand principles of natural law, right and wrong, claim personal responsibility, and stop making excuses in order to develop true sovereignty and self-governance. The answer is in the mirror. We are the answer through the expansion and evolution of our consciousness in true education, spending our time and paying attention on raising ourselves because we were not properly raised to raise our conscious awareness and understanding of ourselves and reality. This is the requirement for us to advance, change, and evolve as a species up the ladder of consciousness and breaking the chains of our current condition into a new world peace, harmony, and prosperity. Living in, f in harmony with natural law leads to peace, freedom, prosperity, survival, and evolutionary progress. Living in opposition to natural law is control, enslavement, poverty, war, evolutionary stagnation, and eventually extinction. The final st section, to reiterate again, the choice is ours. It's always ours. We have to learn, and we have much to learn and face in ourselves if we are to alter our current course. Here's a quote by Vernon Howard. Human sickness is so severe that few can bear to look at it, but those who do will become evil. Again, the need to look into the evil and immoralities of our ways and the ways of the world in order to learn about them and heal them. Other ways there, there is no healing, it's impossible. Our current condition does not need to be this way. The solution to the virus infecting our hearts and minds is us. Mark Passio has accurately used Four terms to describe part of the process to help us get out of our self-created suffering. Recognition, respect, responsibility, and reconciliation. And he's recently gone back into that in recent podcasts. I think he's mentioned it once. With respect to uh, self-recognition of our self-knowledge, uh, self-respect, and self-love, um, self-responsibility, and the reconciliation, I don't know what that one is. But there was self-knowledge, self self-respect, self-love, and self-responsibility. We need to recognize, to know again, by examination and identification to determine the similarities and differences that various aspects share in common. In this search, 
we can recognize and know things as they are and relate to each other and come to look back again at ourselves and see if what we are doing is the right thing. To look back again is in respect. Self-respect, looking at ourselves again and again, is how we develop true, resp true responsibility to respond in moral ways to our situations in life. When we, ha when we have faced ourselves in true respect to change our ways in alignment with what is right, good, and true, we can reconcile and move towards each other again in the spirit of courage to do the right thing and let go of our attachment to the psychopathic institutions manipulating our way of living. Truth unites, lies divide. The only way to move forward towards each other and unite is through truth. The more we are divergent in our recognition of reality as it is, the more we diverge from unity with truth and each other. And that's why I have made a big presentation called Foundational Living and True Unity in order to dispel people who people who understand natural law, but they don't understand what unity is. Even though they, they express things like and, and seem to understand what it is. You cannot have true unity with people who are allied with falsity that you are not allied with, with people who are aligned with immorality that you are not aligned with, with people who are united with evil that you are not united with. It's very, 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 very simple. Yet people all over the truth movement, the so-called truth movement, are trying to beg people to unite. New Age movement is really infatuated with this false unity. Oh, unite! Oh, that's so divisive! Oh, don't create conflict! It's so divisive! We need to unite! These people don't even understand the basics of how unity works. You cannot have unity with contradiction, which is what this paragraph was saying. When we reconcile ourselves and move towards what is right, good, and true, change our ways into what is right, good, and true, align with what is right, good, and true, after we face ourselves in true self-respect and own up to the responsibility to live in ways that are right, good, and true, to live in morality, then, then, and only then, can we move towards each other in the spirit of courage to do what is right together. Only then. Prior to then, prior to people being on the same page, on the lame, same level of morality, well, you can only create with other people at your level. So everyone else that's not at your level, all you can do is interact with them. You can interact with them. You can do things. You can teach them. Try to get them to learn. But you will never, ever create a true unity with them at the level you're capable of creating at because you're going to be coercing yourself to allow their evil to continue. That's It's that simple. Foundational living and true unity. Go look at my presentation. 23 infographics. It should become apparently obvious that you cannot unite with anyone at a lower moral position than you. I don't care what other garbage they believe in. If it's true or not, it doesn't matter. I'm talking about morality. You can only ally with people at your moral baseline, at your level of moral living. And the deepest one is the moral baseline of doing no harm to all beings. So if you're at that level and other people aren't and they're still harming others and they don't have a problem with it, well, guess what? You're not going to ally with them. They're corrupted. They're still living completely, wholly, largely in the false self, only have minutiae of the true self through the knowledge they've gained, but they still haven't reached the depths of truth and morality to develop their true self to a higher capacity. Anyways, three or four paragraphs and we're done. So, recognition through examination and identification with what is increases our awareness, widens our worldview and scope to encompass all suffering that is occurring, concern only for ourselves, our own suffering, and the negative consequences that affect only our personal lives is not a good enough reason to want to solve the problems we face, because then it's purely from selfishness, my freedom, my truth, and my survival, which is 99% of the truth movement, and even people who understand Mark Passio's work still live in this modality, because they don't give a shit about other beings, because they don't really care about truth and morality to that depth. It's still only about them, their truth, their survival, and their freedom. And the other people 
the other humans matter because the other humans will be able to help them bring about their freedom. But the non-human animals, well, they don't matter because nothing they can do can help bring me my freedom, so I don't give a shit about them. So it's all self-centered, Satanism. Carnism, Satanism, and solipsism are, are really related. Even people who claim they're not solipsists who want to reject deeper understanding of truth and morality, well, sorry, you are a solipsist, because as Satanism focuses on survival and self-preservation, so does a carnist, and both of them reject truth of morality. Hence, a solipsist, a moral relativist, because you don't understand objective morality. It only applies to the human sphere. That's not objective morality. You don't understand what free will is. You don't understand what consciousness is. I've been doing a lot of work breaking that down in etymology. Go look into it. Even the controllers and manipulators that create havoc and cause others to suffer are suffering themselves. These psychopaths fear and therefore seek to control. The ideology is that if you can control everything around you, then it cannot hurt you. They are in fear of being discovered as people who are incapable of feeling the normal range of human emotions. They fear how others would react, so they seek to control in order to survive and protect themselves. They are hurting and take out their aggression on others in complex ways. Things can be different in enough... Sorry. Things can be different if enough people care to do the work to understand the causal factors of suffering that originate from within ourselves and care to change. Change is the action that requires courage to overcome our fears. We have free will choice to make decisions even if it leads to more suffering and is against the goals that we want or wish to have. What we create for ourselves is based on our alignment with natural law or ignoring it. So that was the article on Universal Cosmic Natural Moral Law a.k.a. natural law, a.k.a. morality, a.k.a. consequences to behavior, a.k.a. karma, etc. Anyways, I have all those also, in, also known as in my own natural law, trivium and consciousness chart that I made. So, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope it was informative. Until next time. This is Chris Nelson for Evolve Consciousness. Take care. Peace.